The previous two lectures described the emergence of agrarian civilizations in several different regions, and we saw that they had some distinctive features. Now what we're going to do is focus once more on their similarities. We want to understand agrarian civilizations as a distinctive phenomenon in human history, one of the emergent phenomena, if you like, generated in the course of human history. Such phenomena can tell us a lot about our nature as a species, which is why it's important to stand back and try to see them clearly and not get too tangled up in the specific details of specific uh, civilizations. Why were all agrarian civilizations so similar, despite the limited contacts between them, particularly early on in the era of agrarian civilizations? It's very important to appreciate that the similarities between them, and there are a lot, as we'll see, are in fact odd. Why should humans not have developed, for example, utterly different types of communities as each region went its own merry way? so that we'd have seen absolutely no similarities between human history in different parts of the world. What pressures might have steered human history in different regions along loosely similar paths? Of course, the question is particularly striking if you contrast the Afro-Eurasian and American zones, because at present we have no evidence of any significant contact between these regions. So as with the history of agriculture, this odd simultaneity suggests very powerfully that though our gifts as a species did not rigidly determine the course of human history, what they did do was they tended to nudge it in distinctive directions. And very loosely, we can even define the nature of that direction. Collective learning ensured that over time humans would control more and more resources. That would allow populations to grow. That would allow for denser and inevitably more complex types of communities. Now, once these more complex, denser communities have emerged, people in quite different parts of the world were likely to find themselves facing many of the same challenges. How to organize large groups so as to achieve collective goals, goals they all shared. How to prevent excessive conflict within and between groups. How to defend themselves when conflict was unavoidable, how to deal with garbage, how to deal with disease, and so on. All these problems were bound to emerge once denser, more complex communities appeared. And the fact that the challenges were rather similar may explain why there are so many interesting similarities in the solutions that humans came up with quite independently in different regions. So the many striking similarities between agrarian civilizations even where there was no significant contacts, count as one of the most interesting and important factors about human history. Because they provide powerful reasons for thinking that human, direct, human history is in some sense directional, that it was shaped by large general factors that you can only see if you look at human history on a large scale. So here in the, and in the next few lectures, we'll be looking at some of these similar features and trends. This lecture concentrates on some of the general structural features of the 4,000-year era that was dominated by the presence of agrarian civilizations. Instead of discussing each civilization in turn, we'll discuss these large features that they all seem to have shared. As Robert Wright puts it, if we relax our vision and let the details go fuzzy, then a larger picture comes into focus. As the centuries fly by, civilizations may come and go, but civilization flourishes, growing in scope and complexity. Now, l let me take a little time out to be clear about some definitions and labels. Though labels for eras and types of societies are inevitably artificial, we need them. Because to understand the past, and particularly to see the large patterns that we look for in big history, we have to break the past into manageable chunks. Now remember that we're using two linked labels for the epoch from 3000 BCE to about 1000 CE. Essentially they're synonyms. One is the later agrarian era, 
and the other is the era of agrarian civilization. So if I use one of these labels, I'm implying the other. They mean the same thing. The later agrarian era, or era of agrarian civilizations, was dominated, it was the era dominated by agrarian civilizations. And agrarian civilizations we've seen are large, networked regions with cities. It's the word cities, incidentally, that explains the word civilizations. Civilizations is related to the Latin word for citizen and tribute taking states. And all of this is sustained by the labor of millions of peasants or small farmers. Now there's a second piece of terminology we need to clarify, although we've used it already, and that's the idea of world zones. Before the modern era, human history played out in four separate world zones. These had virtually no contact within, with each other, though within the zones there was at least some degree of, con of, of contact right across them. So it was as if human history took place on four separate planets. Now this we've seen is a direct result of the fact that geologically speaking, we live in an era of the planet's history when the, the continental plates are scattered scattered over the surface of the Earth. So that's what, what generates this parallel history in different world zones. And it's the parallels between the different histories of different world zones that raise some of the deepest questions about the driving forces of human history. Now, let me just briefly summarize some of the main features of each of these zones. The zones, incidentally, existed, of course, in the Paleolithic era, but they become really, really significant and helpful as a conceptual device in the agrarian era and particularly in understanding the later agrarian era. So let's look at them. First, the Afro-Eurasian zone, the zone that includes Africa and Eurasia, these two huge land masses. The Afro-Eurasian world zone includes not only Afro, Af Africa and Eurasia but also offshore islands such as Britain and Japan. It was the most ancient of the world zones because this is where humans evolved in Africa. It was also the largest and the most varied of the world zones. It reaches from the tropics to the Arctic and it reaches almost around at least a third of the world. And this may explain this combination of age, diversity and size may explain its dominant role in world history. This we've seen is where agriculture first appeared as well as the earliest agrarian civilizations. So in some sense, the pace of history is also speeded up, at least in some parts of this world zone. The Americas are the second world zone. Since the two American continents touched each other a few million years ago, this is counted as one world zone. In a slightly different geological environment, they might have counted as two. So the American world zone, North America and South America, was the second largest, though it was settled quite late, probably within the last 13 to 15,000 years, although it's conceivable, as we've seen, that some, some settlement was earlier. Now, this was the second world zone in which agrarian civilizations appeared quite independently, though they appeared, as we've seen, significantly later than in Afro-Eurasia. The third world zone I've called Australasia. The Australasian world zone includes modern Australia and Papua New Guinea, as well as offshore islands such as Tasmania. And one justification for, for linking those three areas is that, as we saw during the last ice age, they were indeed a single landmass when world sea levels were lower than they are today. Now, this was the second of the world zones to be occupied by humans. Humans arrived here probably as early as about 50,000 years ago. But in this world zone, the striking and interesting thing is that though agriculture did appear in Papua New Guinea, it was based there on root crops which could not be stored easily and did not therefore provide the foundation for a flourishing agrarian civilization. And in the main part of this zone, in the Australian continent, agriculture itself did not appear. So here, no agrarian civilizations emerged. That's the third world zone, the Australasian zone. The fourth 
often gets omitted in surveys of, of this era. It's the Pacific Zone. It was settled within the last 4,000 years by seafaring communities from Southeast Asia who brought the elements of agriculture with them. So here in this zone, some elements of agrarian civilization, or probably we should say sort of embryonic signs of agrarian civilization did appear. They appeared on some of the larger islands, such as Hawaii. But in general, the islands of the Pacific were too small to support communities large enough to count as major agrarian civilizations. So, in summary, we can say that agrarian civilizations appeared in only two of our world zones, the Afro-Eurasian and American zones. Though humans had appeared in all four zones, and in some sense, agriculture had appeared in all four zones. Now, before we return to agrarian civilizations, we need to remember one more thing about them, about them and that is that they never included all human societies. Do you remember the, uh, the bar scenes in Star Wars? Here you find odd, somewhat dangerous looking people who are clearly from the edges, from the margins. They are barbarians. All agrarian regions, all agrarian civilizations were surrounded by regions that their elites tended to look down upon and regard as barbarians. For the Greeks, incidentally, the word barbarian may have conveyed, been a way of conveying the sort of stammering noise that they heard when listening to foreigners. So, not everyone lived within agrarian civilizations, even in the era of agrarian civilizations. What other types of communities were there? Well, getting a clear list of this will help, um, because it'll help us get a sense of the major types of human communities that coexisted in this era. And this, this era, we'll see, is one of the most varied eras in human history. OK, one of the major groups that continued to exist on the borders, usually on the borders, or sometimes well beyond the borders of agrarian civilizations, were communities of independent farmers. Many people continued to live in small farming communities with rudimentary political structures. Now, these are survivals, if you like, of the villages of the early agrarian era. So these communities represent the survival of the world of the early agrarian era. Much of northern Europe, incidentally, uh, consisted of communities like this in the time of the Roman Empire. This was the barbarian frontier that the Romans fought in northern Europe. Now, a second type of community are pastoral nomads. In arid regions of Inner Asia, parts of North Africa and parts of East Africa and in the Middle East, there were communities of pastoral nomads. Some of them, like the Mongols in the 13th century, would pose very serious threats to neighboring agrarian civilizations. And the reason for this is that the lifeway of pastoral nomads inculcated military skills, the capacity to move through the landscapes, the ability to hunt, the ability to manage large animals, uh, endurance, so that pastoral nomads were ferocious and dangerous enemies. You could simply mobilize most of the men and you've got an army. I've done a fair bit of reading about pastoral nomads and they absolutely fascinate me and I wish I could justify devoting more time to them in this course. But the only, the, the only thing I'll say is that these pastoral nomadic communities, particularly the ones in Inner Asia, would form very, very powerful rivals to great agrarian civilizations. On the North Chinese border, for example, conflict with pastoral nomads was probably the dominant issue in foreign policy for some 2,000 years. So pastoral nomads are immensely interesting and immensely important, but reluctantly, I'm going to have to move on. The third major type of human community that we need to remember about throughout the era of agrarian civilizations is foraging communities. That is to say, communities that lived with the sort of technologies that we saw in the Paleolithic era. In some regions, such as Australia, everyone continued to live uh, live in foraging communities. Foraging remained the dominant technology, the dominant lifeway in Australia until modern times. 
And foraging communities could be found in Australia and many other parts of the world, indeed, right into the 20th century. So, when we talk about agrarian civilizations, we must never forget that there are also these other communities. And though they were less numerous than the populations of agrarian civilizations, they occupied very large areas of the world. So, now, the typology of different types of human communities that we're slowly building up has four main members. Kin-based foraging communities typical of the Paleolithic, the communities of farmers living in villages or very small towns that was typical of the early agrarian era. Third, the pastoral nomadic communities of the steppes and of arid zones. And finally, the large complex communities of agrarian civilizations. This typology gives us a good idea of the range of different types of community that our species could live in. And it's striking to contrast this range, by the way, with the much more limited range we find in our close relatives, the great apes. This is one more reminder of the astonishing variety of ways in which our species has lived in the course of its history. Now, now let's turn finally to agrarian civilizations. And I want to some, uh, summarise some of the crucial structural similarities between them. Wherever they appeared, whether there was contact between them or not, agrarian civilizations showed some similar features. The first is size. Agrarian civilizations are very large communities compared to all earlier human communities. They were huge and complex with hundreds of thousands or millions of inhabitants linked by religion, trade, economics and politics. So the appearance of agrarian civilization marks a sort of quantum leap in the size and interconnectedness of human communities. That's the first feature, size. Secondly, what supported them? What sustained them? They were supported by the surplus labor and produce, above all, of peasants of peasant farmers who made up most of the population. Now, peasant life was tough in agrarian civilizations. And to illustrate this, I want to use some wonderful, vivid passages from an Egyptian document written about 3,200 years ago, uh, at the end of the second millennium BCE. This document is, is, consists of advice, uh, advice to a young man about the types of careers to take up. And, and the first piece of advice you'll see is, do not be a peasant. It's a reminder that within agrarian civilizations, peasants didn't just feed themselves. That alone was tough enough. But like domestic animals, they also had to support others. And forcing peasants to support others could be a brutal process. So, let's look at this document. The document begins by describing the trials of being a peasant. By day it goes, he cuts his farming tools, by night he twists rope. Even his midday hour he spends on farm labour. In other words, being a peasant is endless, there's always something to be done. It goes on. He equips himself to go to the field as if he were a warrior. The dried field lies before him. He goes out to get his team, his team of, of draft animals. When he has been after the herdsman for many days, he gets his team and comes back with it. So first he has to go and locate his team, which, is, which has got lost. Then the document goes on to describe how the team of oxen may have drowned in a swamp. He's lost his oxen, one of his most crucial capital assets. So he has to borrow a team from someone else. He scatters seeds, they're immediately eaten by snakes, according to this document. And because his seeds are eaten, he has to borrow seed as well as as well as a, a team of, 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 of draft animals. Now finally he gets in trouble with an official, the all-powerful scribe, and at this point we see how the state, the tribute-taking system, also causes headaches for the peasant. So here's how this, this section goes. Now the scribe lands on the shore. He surveys the harvest. Attendants are behind him with staffs, Nubians with clubs, one of them says to the peasant, give grain. That conveys very nicely, actually, the, the, the fundamentally arbitrary and brutal way in which 
tribute-taking states often demanded resources. Give grain. There is none, says the peasant. The document continues. He is beaten savagely. He is bound, thrown in the well, submerged head down. His wife is bound in his presence. His children are in fetters. His neighbours abandon them and flee. When it's over, there's no grain. Now, this is a vivid, literary and heightened account of the world of the peasantry. But as someone who spent a fair bit of time studying the life of 19th century Russian peasants, I have to say, I don't really think it's overdrawn. Being a peasant in the era of agrarian civilizations really was tough. Now, another general feature of agrarian civilizations is specialization and a division of labor. This is a world in which, unlike the world of the early agrarian, uh, the, of ag early agrarian villages, where most people lived roughly the same, you hear you get in agrarian civilizations a vast range of different specializations, different professions. Minorities, particularly in towns and cities, supported themselves by exchanging specialist skills. Now, the Egyptian document I've just used describes several of these professions. So let me quote it again. And once again, this is, remember, is a warning to a young man not to attempt these professions. The potter, it goes on, is smeared with earth like a person, one of whose folk has died. His hands and feet are full of clay. He is like one who is in the mire. Then it goes on to describe another profession, the sandal maker, someone who works with leather. The sandal maker mixes tan. His odour is conspicuous. His hands are red with matter, like one who is smeared with his own blood. So there's a whole range of professions, a great diversity of professions. Now, here's a fourth critical feature of agrarian civilizations, and that's the existence of tribute-taking states. At the core, these were the organizing centers of agrarian civilizations. At their core, we find tribute-taking states. Now, I've defined why I use this term already. States exacted resources in labor, goods, or cash. Tributary rulers and their servants claimed that they had the right to exact resources. They often claimed that that right was based on religious sanctions, that they had the blessing of the gods. But they could always back up those claims with the threat of force, and we call such exactions tributes. Their coercive power depended always on the existence of organized armies or, at the minimum, retinues of some kind that could defend against external attacks and could also suppress internal resistance or, as in the case of the scribe we've just seen, could impose their will on resistant taxpayers. Administrative tasks within tribute-taking states, such as the collection and storage of tributes or the administration of justice and law, were handled by organized groups of literate officials. Now, the document we've been quoting portrays the life of a scribe. And, and, and now its author gets to the point, because what the author's going to recommend to the young man it's being written for is be a scribe. This is a much more attractive life than that of the tribute-paying classes, because now you're entering the elite world of tribute-takers. So here's the description of being, being a scribe. You call to one and a thousand answer to you. You stride freely upon the road and do not become like an ox to be handed over. Attired in fine raiment, with horses whilst your bark is on the Nile, you are provided with attendants, moving freely and inspecting. A villa has been built in your city and you hold a powerful office by the king's gift to you. Male and female slaves are in your neighbourhood and those who are in the fields in holdings of your own making will grasp your hand. This gives you some feeling for being a, a lord in this world, a member of the elite classes. Writing, of course, is crucial to the work of the scribe. And writing in some form appears in all agrarian civilizations. Though in some cases, as in the case of the Inca, it assumed fairly rudimentary forms. In most cases, it, it's, it, it seems to have begun as a form of accounting or record keeping, and then eventually turned, acquired a literary form. Tributary rulers in all tributary states built monumental architecture. Tombs, palaces and temples, 
designed to show their majesty and power. These were a sort of form of pre-modern propaganda. They were designed to impress enemies and to impress their own subjects. But they were also a demonstration of their power because it took a lot of organization to build these things. And at lower levels, rulers depended on local nobles or officials who duplicated their power on smaller scales, such as the scribe we've been describing. Now here's a fifth general feature of agrarian civilizations, is the existence of hierarchies, and often quite rigid hierarchies. It's, it's tempting to think of the word caste when we describe them. Hierarchies very often based on birth, but not exclusively. There were steep hierarchies of wealth and power. Class hierarchies ranked groups by their lineage and social status. Aristocracies were distinguished by their lineage, power, lifestyle and wealth. And this was a world that was acutely conscious of rank and status. Members of, the, of ruling elites generally despised the peasants who generated most of society's wealth. And again, you can pick that up from the passages I've just been reading. They also tended to regard those outside agrarian civilizations as inferior or subhuman. Uncivilized, in fact. As in the following document from an 18th century Qing dynasty emperor, Yong Zhen. Emperor Yong Zhen writes in 1730, What makes humans different from animals are the principles of morality. The five relationships are the basis of human morality. If you defy one of them, you are not human. The primary relationship of these is that of ruler and subject. In other words, if you don't exist within an agrarian civilization, you're not really a human being. How can we call people human if they have no rulers? Those who want to get rid of rulers are just like animals. Those who are given rulers by heaven's mandate but try to defy heaven, in other words, rebels, cannot avoid being exterminated by heaven. Now, this was his polite way, or not so polite, of saying that the pastoral nomads on China's northern frontier with whom he'd engaged in a, re a major war barely counted as humans because they lived out they were beyond the pale outside of agrarian civilizations another group that the elites of tribute taking societies often despised were merchants though merchants were sometimes very wealthy and powerful they were often deeply despised by aristocrats now here's a document that illustrates illustrates this and it again comes from china but this time from china in the Han era, the second century BCE. And this writer clearly sees merchants as standing below peasants because they didn't seem to do anything very useful. This was a conventional Confucian idea of the nature of social hierarchies. Well-to-do merchants, writes our source, Chao Tso, well-to-do merchants accumulate goods and redouble their profits, while the less well-to-do sit in their shops and sell. They control the markets and daily enjoy their ease in the cities. They take advantage of the pressing needs of the government to sell at twice the normal price. Their sons do not plough or hoe. In other words, they don't do anything very productive or useful. Their daughters do not raise silkworms or weave. They have fancy clothing and they stuff themselves on millet and meat. This conveys quite well a sort of der derision or scorn of merchants that is characteristic of tribute-taking elites. Power hierarchies also shaped gender hierarchies. As most rulers were men, women rulers were generally regarded as exceptional, which is why, incidentally, the pharaoh Hatshepsut is often represented wearing a fake beard. However, women often ruled indirectly through husbands, lovers or fathers. We shouldn't think that women were absent from these power structures at all. The Byzantine historian Anna Komnena, whose dates are 1083 to 1153, describes very vividly the immense power wielded by her mother. And here is a description from her history that conveys well the power of her mother. Uh, it was composed, her history of, of, of the reign of her father, Alexis Komnenos, incidentally, was composed in a monastery where she'd been exiled after an unsuccessful plot. And she modelled her work on the great Greek historians. She writes... One might be amazed that my father accorded his mother such high honour 
and that he deferred to her in all respects, as if he were turning over the reins of the empire to her and running alongside her while she drove the imperial chariot, contenting himself simply with the title of emperor. He took upon himself the wars against the barbarians, and whenever battles and combats pertained to them, while he entrusted to his mother the complete management of civil affairs, the selection of civil magistrates, the collection of incoming revenues, and the expenses of the government. She was, argues Anna Komnena, one of the most expert politicians of the time. And I think that account suggests that we should always look for powerful women in the background when we're thinking of tribute-taking states. Though women formally were subordinate, very often they were crucial in traditional power structures. Okay, now let's summarise some of this. In this lecture, I've tried to survey some of the general structural features of agrarian civilizations. In the next lecture, we start looking at how agrarian civilizations evolved over the 4,000 years since their first appearance. Thank you. See them clearly and not get too tangled up in the specific details of specific uh, civilizations. Why were all agrarian civilizations so similar, despite the limited contacts between them, particularly early on in the era of agrarian civilizations? It's very important to appreciate that the similarities between them, and there are a lot, as we'll see, are in fact odd. Why should humans not have developed, for example, utterly different types of communities as each region went its own merry way? so that we'd have seen absolutely no similarities between human history in different parts of the world. What pressures might have steered human history in different regions along loosely similar paths? Of course, the question is particularly striking if you contrast the Afro-Eurasian and American zones, because at present, collective goals, goals they all shared, how to prevent excessive conflict within and between groups, how to defend themselves when conflict was unavoidable, how to deal with garbage, how to deal with disease, and so on. All these problems were bound to emerge once denser, more complex communities appeared. And the fact that the challenges were rather similar may explain why there are so many interesting similarities in the solutions that humans came up with quite independently in different regions. So the many striking similarities between agrarian civilizations, even where there was no significant contact, count as one of the most interesting and important factors about human history, because they provide powerful reasons for thinking that human, direction, human history is in some sense directional, that it was shaped by large general factors that you can only see. The previous two lectures described the emergence of agrarian civilizations in several different regions, and we saw that they had some distinctive features. Now what we're going to do is focus once more on their similarities. We want to understand agrarian civilizations as a distinctive phenomenon in human history, one of the emergent phenomena, if you like, generated in the course of human history. Such phenomena can tell us a lot about our nature as a species, which is why it's important to stand back and try to present we have no evidence of any significant contact between these regions. So as with the history of agriculture, this odd simultaneity suggests very powerfully that though our gifts as a species did not rigidly determine the course of human history, what they did do was they tended to nudge it in distinctive directions. And very loosely, we can even define the nature of that direction. Collective learning ensured that over time humans would control more and more resources. That would allow populations to grow. That would allow for denser and inevitably more complex types of communities. 
Now, once these more complex, denser communities have emerged, people in quite different parts of the world were likely to find themselves facing many of the same challenges. How to organize large groups so as to achieve C, if you look at human history on a large scale. So here in the, and in the next few lectures, we'll be looking at some of these similar features and trends. This lecture concentrates on some of the general structural features of the 4,000 year era that was dominated by the presence of agrarian civilizations. Instead of discussing each civilization in turn, we'll discuss these large features that they all seem to have shared. As Robert Wright puts it, if we relax our vision and let the details go fuzzy, then a larger picture comes into focus. As the centuries fly by, civilizations may come and go, but civilization flourishes, growing in scope and complexity. Now, let me take a little time out to be clear about some 